symphony orchestra. That was the opening of Britain's first solo cello suite, one of my all-time favourite pieces and one of the best written works for the cello in my opinion. Thanks so much for watching this demonstration of the cello and what it can do. I'll start by talking a bit about how the cello works in terms of producing sound and some general points about writing for the cello and its role in the orchestra. I'll then cover the right hand and the bow and the sort of techniques and things we can do with it and then I'll do the same with the left hand. I'll finish off by talking about some extended techniques that cellists are sometimes asked to do um, in contemporary pieces to give you some ideas about what does and doesn't work well and hopefully to inspire you in your own music. Firstly a bit about me. Um, I studied music at Cambridge University followed by four more years training at the Royal Academy of Music in London and at the Eastman School in the US. Uh, when I came back to the UK, I freelanced for about nine years before getting the number two job in the Orchestra of Opera North and then joining the BBC Symphony Orchestra in 2017. I play an English cello uh, that belonged to my grandmother, probably made by the Italian maker Vincenzo Camormo whilst he worked at the Betts workshop in London and made at some point between the 1790s and the early 1800s. I love the possibility that the instrument could have been in London at the same time as Haydn was here and that it could have played some of his music in its early years whilst he was still alive. So how does a cello make it sound? Essentially it's a hollow wooden box with four strings tuned the interval of a fifth apart, A, D, G and C, which are stretched from the tailpiece over the bridge and wound onto tuning pegs in the peg box. Sound is made by drawing the bow hair, which comes from horse hair, over the strings, which in turn creates friction and causes vibrations across the strings which resonate through the box. The sound then projects forwards through the F holes at the front of the instrument into the surrounding area. Uh, the thicker a string, the lower a sound it will make due to the slower vibrations it produces. Therefore, as well as being more tightly strung, the D and the A strings are much thinner and quicker to respond than the thicker C string. Despite it looking like a completely smooth action when you draw the bow across the string, what, what's actually happening is that little ridges all the way up the hair catch the string over and over like the teeth of a saw. Uh, fact of the day, I recently discovered that hair on a bow is put on in two directions so that these teeth can catch on both and up and down bows. My old cello teacher used to get us to practice this motion of catch and release calling it burp bowing. This is occasionally called for as a cool sound effect in avant-garde modern pieces. We put rosin on our bows to aid this friction. Uh, rosin is a very powdery substance that comes from tree resin and is also used by dancers on their shoes to give them grip. The little particles of rosin coat the hair and push these little ridges on the hair sideways. Without it, our bows would slip around and make very little to no sound. This was used as an effect in Brett Dean's Testament, where all the string players are required to have two bows, one rosined and one unrosined. Of course, you have to remove the rosin from the strings after using the normal bow, otherwise it transfers back onto the unrosined bow, leaving you with two rosined bows. So a bit about the cello bridge, just for interest, it's a choice for the player alone, but I sometimes get questions about mine by composers. So I've owned this cello since I was a teenager and have made some fairly significant changes to it over the years with my luthier. In addition to a new fingerboard and tailpiece, I replaced the French bridge that was here with a new Belgian style bridge. French bridges are traditional on cellos and tend to produce a more gentle and warm sound. Perfect for some instruments, but I was struggling to get my cello to project. The Belgian bridges have longer legs and a higher arch in the centre, 
creating a sound that's a little more focused and direct. Uh, with a cello that's already very bright, this could be a bit much, but on a woollier instrument like this one, it's just helped to centre the sound a bit. And uh, while we're there, if you're wondering what this black spot is on the front of the cello, it's a magnetic wolf note eliminator. It's something that sounds much more exciting than it actually is. A wolf note is a problem note, uh, which is usually in a specific place on each instrument. It can be anything from a simple resistance to a repeated stuttering sound. Essentially on different instruments it can sound like a wolf howling, hence the name. I've heard it described as a sick cow or even a machine gun. It makes a sort of <laughs> noise. Not all instruments have one, but they usually appear around the E to an F sharp on the G string. And they're usually worse in the same position on the C string. It's the source of much annoyance for some players, and whilst some can work around it by choosing to avoid that particular note on the G string, for instance, and others use eliminators which rarely get rid of it completely without some compromise with the sound elsewhere. The magnet on this one means I can move it around easily and can make a decision according to my needs. It's worth being aware of this when writing for this area of the cello, um, especially if you're writing with a particular player and instrument in mind. I think one of the best things about the cello, both as a player and as a composer, is its huge range probably the most extreme range of any instrument. Officially, our range stretches from our open C, which is two octaves below middle C, all the way up to where the fingerboard ends, which is usually around an E. We can play higher than that, and it's sometimes exploited by composers, but you start getting into the rosin territory, which as I mentioned earlier, is sticky and harder to slide in. And then there's the annoyance of bringing the rosin back with you when you return to a more normal playing position. Because of its extensive range, cello music is usually written across three different clefs for its notation. Uh, the bass clef, tenor clef and treble clef. Uh, the composer should choose the clef most appropriate for that moment in the piece, so they keep as much of the notation on the stave as possible, and to avoid too many ledger lines, which make it harder for the player to read at speed. One of the biggest mistakes I see in new music is composers who have put little thought into which clef they should be using, and as a result make it a lot harder for the player. I would much rather see something in tenor or treble clef than in bass clef with a lot of ledger lines. But equally, don't forget to go back to bass clef when it returns to the lower register. The best way to familiarise yourself with this is probably to look at scores or ideally solo cello pieces such as concertos or things like the Britain Suite that I played at the beginning to see how it's usually tackled. It's probably worth mentioning at this point, mainly for interest, but also for school studying in historical context, there was such a thing in use during the 18th and 19th centuries that is some, sometimes referred to as the false treble clef, in which uh, treble clef is written an octave higher than it sounds. It's not signposted, but is most commonly found in orchestral and chamber music of Borjak, sometimes in Schumann and some Haydn as well. Modern editions sometimes put these sections into the tenor or modern treble clef, but the original notation can give players a bit of a shock when sight reading. Once you've recovered from the fright of thinking you have to play up in the stratosphere up here, then you have to transpose down an octave, something that not all cellists are used to doing. Sometimes it's not clear if it's true or false treble clef, but the context usually gives it away. In the orchestra, the cello is probably closest in range to the French horn, but it's also considered to be the instrument closest in quality to the human voice. In my opinion, that and its lyrical nature is why it's often used for the most beautiful, simple and often heartbreaking, soulful, even painful melodies, and has the ability to evoke almost instinctual emotions in the listener. 
Uh, here are a few pieces that would be worth listening to if you want to explore this further. Um, so look out for the orchestral cello soli moments, like opening of the second movement of Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony or the cello canzona in the second movement of Marla Farm. Other must hears orchestral cello solos in Shostakovich's symphony number 15. The third movement of Brahms' second piano concerto, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, solo cello quartet in Act 3 of Puccini's Tosca, or even the solo cello parts in John Tavner's The Protecting Veil and Tan Dunham's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I mean, this list is pretty much endless, but these are some of my favourites. Of course, orchestral cello parts are not always full of luscious melodies, sadly, but our role is often important in other ways. When not playing a tune on our own or with others, we commonly find driving the bass line along with the double basses, or playing juicy inner parts or counterpoint. And we also have lots of effects up our sleeve, which, as I said, I'll get to in a bit. So now I'd like to go into a bit more detail about our right arm, the bowing arm, and a few pointers about different ways we can use it and how we interpret composers' markings. The bow can go in two directions, down and up, down, and this is the up bow. On a down bow, the bow travels from the frog to the tip of the bow, and it does the reverse on an up bow. Down bows tend to be stronger and are therefore more, most commonly used on down beats. Up bows tend to be weaker and are therefore most commonly used for up beats. There's no need for you to indicate up and down bowings in the part unless you're after a particular effect. In most of the music we play, the choice of the bow is left to us. So I'll go, just go through a few of the most commonly found terms used for bowing and plucking techniques and we'll try and demonstrate them. Uh, so firstly, we use the term arco to mean bowed and we assume everything is bowed unless marked otherwise. Pits or pizzicato, meaning plucked, is marked, then arco must be marked from the next bowing passage to cancel it out. Where unusual bowing techniques are marked, ord, short for ordinaire, or norm, short for normale, will return the player back to normal bow. It's worth pointing out that different schools and styles of string playing interpret some of these next terms differently, so the two or more versions can often seem contradictory. So, I'll start au talon, the French meaning bowed at the frog, and works best loud. And um, punta d'arco means at the point of the bow and is good for sort of delicate effects. Colleno means with the stick. If not otherwise indicated, the bow will often play tratto or stroked or dragged across the string, whilst engaging a bit of the hair to help it speak. So it's best to be as specific as you can if you don't want this. Colleno battuto means to hit the string with the stick of the bow. And colleno soltando means the same, but here the stick of the bow jumps in a single direction achieved by throwing the bow at the string and letting it bounce. Soltando is also possible as a normal bowing technique using the hair. Detaché means detached, so we play separate notes with separate bows. You might say this is sort of the default setting for string players, but it can also be used to cancel out another style of bowing or articulation. breaks between notes. This is usually played as separate notes joined together with as smooth a bow as possible. Tenuto is usually signified by lines over the notes and can be interpreted by players as either sort of full value notes played with a full bow with no separation or with a little dig on each note and a slight separation. So the first one.
varied notes played in a single bow with slight breaks between the notes. It's usually written as lines or dots and a slur over the notes. Staccato, short notes marked by dots, played on or off the string, so it's worth indicating which you want. Spiccato, a very short note, sometimes marked with dots, like staccato, in addition to the word spic. It is usually played off the string using the natural balance of the bow. Tremolo is unmeasured, rapid, down and up bows marked with three or more slashes through the stems of the notes. This can often be confused with repeated measured notes to a player. The quotation of which can look pretty similar. It's really helpful for us to see the word trem written at the start of the passage to avoid confusion. So ricochet is um, a controlled, uncontrollable balance of the bow, um, usually marked by multiple dots and a slur and the word ricochet. So. <laughs> but actually we play it near the bridge. Um, it's usually shortened to sol pont and it gives a sort of icy, glassy sound. And the opposite of which is sol tasto, bowing over the fingerboard, which gives a sort of woolly, soft focus. Sol A, D, G or C played on a single string until indicated otherwise and is usually used when the composer wants a particular timbre or sound type. If you're writing for strings for the first time or are not certain exactly how these terms might be interpreted, please just remember that descriptive words rather than technical terms are often more useful for us than um, an incorrect or ambiguous instruction. Uh, just don't, don't be afraid to use words like spiky or smooth or icy or warm. So mutes. Whilst not strictly a right arm technique, mutes are another great way to change the timbre. The most commonly used are small rubber mutes like this one, which can be slid on and off the bridge and remain attached to the string. <laughs> Mutes, which act like clamps on the bridge. Sadly, mine is in the studios in my second cello case due to lockdown. Um, or metal ones like this one. And you also get wooden ones similar. It's worth making sure you allow the player time to put on or remove their mute. About five seconds or so is helpful. I was once told that if you forget your mute, you can use a folded up £50 note instead, threading it through the strings just below the bridge. Um, makes a really effective mute, but uh, sadly most musicians don't have £50 notes floating around, so I'm yet to try this. Chords. Double stops. So two notes at once, or three notes or four note chords can be such an effective way for a single instrument to create harmony and therefore are common in solo pieces. Um, three or four note chords are basically always spread due to the curvature of the bridge. They're usually spread from bottom to top, but you can mark it if you want it the other way around. So bottom, bottom to top or that's top to bottom. Chords are used in orchestral pieces as well, but are uh, often divided between players. Uh, therefore, it's worth making it very clear if you want every player to play all the notes in the chord by marking it non-div or non divisi or by putting a wiggly line in front of the chord to show that it's spread. A few general points if you're writing non divisi chords. Um, open the strings help the instrument ring and often very helpful to the player as well. 
due to the nature of the cello fingerboard, intonation in chords can be notoriously difficult, particularly with the interval of fourths or fifths across two different strings. So they have to be played at a bit of an angle, which changes as you go up the instrument. So fifths. Um, so please just calculate which note you want to go on each string to make sure the chord is actually playable. It's, sort of, it's amazing how often we get an impossible chords to play with two notes on one string. It's also worth remembering that people have different sized hands. Mine are very little. I can only just stretch an octave on the piano, so the stretch between no, two notes might be possible for some other players and for some players and not for others. Um, here's a bit of the Saraban from Bach Suite number three, just to demonstrate his use of the different kinds of chords, double stops, three notes and four notes. So plucked, uh, meaning plucked, usually marked pit, so. Players sometimes put down their bows for extended passages of pizzicato, um, such as in the third movement of Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony. Um, snap or Bartok pits, I'm going to put my bow now, bow down. The player pulls the string upwards and let it snap down against the fingerboard, so. Often used by Bella Bartok, hence the nickname, and it's usually notated by a circle with a little line through the top of it, a bit like a sort of on button on a computer, or sometimes you can just write snap bits. Uh, pizzicato trebolo uh, is rapid motion of the finger against the string, it's possible, but it's not particularly effective unless it's in a big section. Not pizzicato tremolo per se, but there is a passage of fast repeated semiquaver D pizzas in Holst the Planets, which is fairly notorious for everyone having their own technique and also for getting lost in it. Some people try and repeat it all with one finger. Some use their first and second fingers alternately, and some alternate the left and right first fingers or second fingers on an open D and a stop D on the G string. It's difficult at that speed to make much sound and, as you can hear, to be really accurate rhythmically. Um, Plucked glissandi, uh, notated gliss pits, um, and it's, it's only possible to gliss upwards from an open string, but you can gliss both directions from a stop note. So open string, or if from a stop note you could go, um, pits chords. As with bowed chords, make sure the notes are chosen carefully so that the finger patterns are as simple as possible. You can mark with square brackets if you want certain notes to be played together, or with a squiggly line before the chord if you want the notes to be strummed or spread. You can also put a little arrow at the top or bottom of the squiggly line to indicate the direction the chord should be strummed, so up or down. Uh, if you have repeated chords, it's likely the player would want to alternate strumming upwards and downwards like a guitar. Um, this is used in Britain's variations on the theme of Frank Bridge, for example, um, in his Aria Italiano. It can be so effective, but a player.
plein air request, don't use this technique too much as you can get real blisters on your thumb from it. Uh, left hand pits. Um, this is when you pluck with the left hand rather than the right hand and it's usually notated with a cross over the note. It's quite rare on the cello but it's most effective with open strings and occasionally you can combine it with arco on another string. This is a, this is a bit from the Britain solo suite. <laughs> of vibrato and its use as an expressive tool. Here's the same scale played four times, senza or without vibrato, poco, so a little amount of vibrato, normal and then molto vibrato. <laughs> is not only an expressive tool but also as a sort of orchestration tool. A rich but transparent accompaniment without vibrato will let through a solo line much better than the same one with vibrato as the vibrato can sort of muddy the sound. Harmonics are another really effective tool that cellos have in their toolbox. We can produce two kinds of harmonics. The first is known as natural or open harmonics and is produced when the finger lightly touches the string at a nodal point in the harmonic scale to produce a sort of fluted sound. The natural harmonics on the cello are in mirror image, so they're separated by the halfway point on the string, uh, which is the octave above the open string. whereas the upper one can look really flashy and works well with a glissando up to it. Remember that natural harmonics aren't in equal temperament, so some of them will be slightly out of tune, but you can again play with the evocative nature of that, such as in the opening of part two of The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. harmonics can also be used as glissandos, like in Shostakovich's cello sonata, which is really good fun. The other type of harmonic we can play are known as artificial, false or stopped harmonics and are played by stopping the string normally, usually with the first finger or thumb and then touching the string um, with a fourth or fifth and occasionally a third higher. An effect that composers sometimes employ and is again quite fun to play is the seagull where artificial harmonic, um, an artificial harmonic has glissed from the top of the cello 
usually on the A string, to the bottom of it without changing the left hand shape. Playing harmonics of both types um, is quite often a risky business as they're often difficult to speak, they can be quite fragile, meaning it's easy for the sound to break on them. The natural harmonics, um, with natural harmonics, the higher up the harmonic series you go and therefore the closer together the harmonics are, the harder they become to speak. And with artificial harmonics, the higher up the fingerboard you go, the smaller the gap has to become between your two fingers. So once again, they become harder to play. I find playing closer to the bridge really helps with both kinds of high harmonics, as here you have more overtones, so the harmonics will speak better. It's also worth saying that there's no point writing sol pompe as a mysterious effect with harmonics as it does the absolute opposite, it makes them brighter. And similarly, muted harmonics don't tend to work so well as they dampen the overtones that are important for producing the harmonics and make them much harder to play. Notation for both types of harmonics is not completely standardised and can lead to confusion, um, particularly in older pieces of music. I'm thinking of, sort of Stravinsky in particular, who is known for using lots of different ways to notate the same thing, and Ravel, who basically just gets them all wrong. There are numerous charts and tables you can find online that show you what notation to use to get the sound you want, so it's worth checking those out. My biggest tip is just to be as precise, clear and efficient as you can with what you write. Too many instructions can be as confusing as too few, but above all, just make sure there's no doubt about what pitch should come out especially when natural harmonics are concerned. Congratulations if you've made it this far, you must be really interested in the cello. I'll just finish by going over a few other extended techniques that you can encounter on the cello. This list is by no means exhaustive, as there are about as many different techniques as you can dream up, but these are some more common ones we find. So, microtone. One of the brilliant things about the cello and all string instruments really is that we have infinite control over our tuning. We're often asked to play microtones, quarter tones, like notes that lie halfway between semitones are relatively common in contemporary music. So here's a semitone, and here's a quarter tone. But anything smaller than that can be much harder to pitch, particularly in a section anything like that really. The higher up the cello you get, the smaller the spaces become between intervals, so once again just keep that in mind if you're asking for specific degrees of microtonality. Half harmonics. These produce a veiled, sort of hardly perceptible colouring of the dominant string sound and are achieved by applying morphing pressure than is required for a normal harmonic, but less than a fully stopped note. The idea is to avoid any harmonics from appearing if you can, and they're usually notated with a sort of half black, half white diamond note head like harmonics, um, either in place of the normal note head or floating above the string with instructions. The rest of these techniques generally don't have a standardised system of notation, resulting usually in many questions in rehearsals. They're most commonly shown with written instructions and X-shaped note heads, and occasionally with a sketch or a diagram if it's a less common technique. The most important thing for the player is for the explanations to be precise, concise and without ambiguity. Bowing on the bridge, not to be confused with solpont, produces a whirring sound with sort of indefinite pitches and is usually helped by damping the strings with the left hand. Bowing on the side of the bridge results in a sort of clear, toneless bowing sounds. Although if you get closer to the arch down here, you might get squeaky whistling sounds, mine doesn't usually, but sometimes. Um, you can also use colenio tratto on the bridge. 
or battuto on the side of the bridge. Bowing or plucking behind the bridge or plucking in the peg box produces sort of squeaky sounds with indefinite pitches but plucking in either of these places isn't likely to be very loud. You can bow on the tailpiece or on the tuning pegs and it produces a sort of soft ghostly sound. Uh, tapping the body of the instrument, you can tap the body or the shoulders, preferably with your palm or knuckle, is it with the knuckles? But please, please avoid asking players to use the end of their bow or a beater on their instrument, just remember how old and valuable most of these instruments are. You've got silent fingering, um, which is where you finger pitches with the left hand without bowing or plucking the strings. Again, it's a very quiet effect and most effectively used with a whole string section at once. You've also got left hand string muting, when the left hand dampen or mute the strings whilst the right hand bows or pizzicates those them as normal. The result when bowing arco is a sort of whistly sound with indefinite pitch. And um, when using colenio battuto or battuto with the bow screw, which is this bit on the end, the result is a sort of subtle pitch which varies according to where both the left hand stopping occurs as well as the vertical point where the bow strikes the string. Scordatura tuning um, is when you retune the strings, such as in the Kadai solo cello sonata, where the G and C strings are detuned by semitone. It's, it's an incredible effect, but can play mind games on the player. Usually the composer writes for those strings as transposing instruments, so what you see is not what you hear. I'd highly recommend avoiding asking for anything more than a tone for the instrument's sake, and it's preferable to tune flatter rather than sharper. Make sure you allow the player also just enough time to detune and retune, and ideally the opportunity to hear themselves in the process. As I say, there are endless other techniques that can be employed on string instruments, so go ahead and experiment, but always keep the player and the vulnerability of their instrument in mind when asking for anything unusual. I'd recommend reading something like Extended Notation, The Depiction of the Unconventional by Christian Dimke and looking at works by Bartok, Pendrecki, Holliger, Zanakis, Fernie Howe, Helmut Lackenmann or George Crumb um, for other examples of interesting techniques and or extended notation. I really hope you've enjoyed this talk about the cello. I have. In summary, I'd say the key to writing good cello parts is basically to remember that it's almost certainly the most versatile of the string instruments and it's certainly one of the most versatile in the orchestra. Life is much more enjoyable for us as players when we're used in interesting and varied ways, rhythmic bass lines, soaring melodies, juicy counter melodies, near voices, a bit of everything you might say, but honestly the way to a cellist's heart is with a good tune.